Good morning, Resurrection Church. How y'all doing? Now I can see you. Hey, turn around, look at all those great kids back there. Hi, guys. <laughs> My name is Ken Scott. I'm the eldest elder. And do you know how glad I am to be here this morning? You guys are my encouragers. I heard a report this week that there was more discouragement in the world today than any time in history. I don't know where the research came from or how accurate it is, but it certainly fits the reality we see around us, huh? The same source describes social media as a lot of discouraged people trying to discourage a lot of other discouraged people. And that TV networks make their money by reporting discouraging news. A lot of reasons to be discouraged. But this is a place of hope and good news, a place of encouragement. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You hear that? We, we are overcomers. We are overcomers not because of how strong we are, but because of Christ and one another. He overcame sin on the cross and overcame death by his resurrection. Each of you helped me overcome discouragement every time we meet together. I can get pretty discouraged by seeing the prayer requests that you guys turn in every week because I see so many of you having the same struggles as I have. But let me tell you how encouraged I get when a small group of faithful people come together on Tuesday nights and pray for you and one another. And every week when we're together here, I'm encouraged to see and talk with you guys and to hear the ultimate good news and encouragement from this stage, both from the music and the word. So thank you for being here. If you're able, please stand with us and worship our ultimate hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, you made me see. And 
nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin.
Oh, Jesus. All we need is found in you, God. Right here in your loving arms, God. Everything we ever will need is found in you, God. You love us. We are who you say we are, God. You're the ones who created us. You're the one who breathes life into us. You're the one who gives us purpose, Lord. And you're here in this place right now, Lord. We're here because of you for your glory, God. Thank you for these moments of worship where we could sing you the praise you rightfully deserve, God. We're just so thankful to be here in this moment of praise with you, Father. In the moment, just knowing that your arms are here around us, Lord, everything we need is right here in you, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for how richly you love us, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Let's take a second and welcome some people around us. Good morning. Oh, hello. There we go. Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Come on, guys. How are you doing today? You guys are rowdy today. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. How many of you guys were here last week for our reservory? It was a blast, and we had a bunch of deviled eggs. And I had someone... I had someone make me a platter just for myself. It was amazing, amazing. She said now that she has to be my girlfriend. I said, absolutely. <laughs> we are so glad you guys are here today. If you are a guest, please excuse me and being so rowdy. My name is Pastor Mark. I'm one of the lead pastors around here. If you are a guest and you have never filled out one of these cards in the few in front of you, in the pew, in front of you, you'll find one of these cards that says, I'm new here. If you wouldn't mind taking a second, filling this out. At the end of the service, you can put it in the offering boxes, which are at all the exits when you leave. You'll see people putting all of their, their ties in there. And so you'll know that's where to go. Um, it's a way that we can connect with you. It's a way that we can let you know what's going on in the church and a way we can better understand how we can better minister to you. So please, please, please take a second, fill this out. Also, in the pew in front of you, you'll find this I Need Prayer card. We have teams of people, uh, Elder Kent talked about that earlier today, that love to pray for our church family, to love to pray for the broken, love to celebrate when we have prayer requests and um, prayer celebrations when the prayers came true. And so um, take a second, fill this out, put it in the offering boxes before you leave. One big thing you need to know is coming up next Saturday, so this coming Saturday, we have a work day, and it's not on this campus. It's going to be at our kids' building in the downtown campus. It's from 1 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So next Saturday, 1 to 5, we are clearing out our, the, the kids' space there because we're no longer using it. So we need to get it all cleared out so that uh, the collective church, who is now using that space, will have a clean space to be able to use so please, 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 if you can, next Saturday from 1 to 5, we can really use your help in getting that building cleared out so that uh, we can be good stewards and give the building back the way we found it. So we thank you for that. Now I'm going to pray for um, our service. I'm going to pray for uh, Pastor Vance as he's about to come up and deliver God's message today. So let's pray. Father God, Lord, we love you, God, and we're so thankful that we have a church home that we can gather and worship you and learn more about you, God, where we can support and encourage our church family together, Lord. We just thank you for that opportunity, Lord. Today, we just pray for our service, God. We pray for your message that Pastor Vance is about to deliver, Lord. God, we just ask you to uh, open our ears and open our minds to hear your word, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nate, our, the guy that was playing right over here, he designs those uh, intros that we have for each message, and I think that sounded like Rachel uh, that was singing, so that was pretty awesome. By the way, the praise band was in fine fiddle, weren't they? Oh, yeah. That's a way to start. If you weren't awake when you got here, you are now, and that's awesome. All right, we are starting again going back to Ephesians. And I am very, very excited to start off this four-part series where we are going to be finishing up the letter. But some of the things that we're going to be sharing over the next four Sundays, um, to me, are extremely important things that we need to be aware of if we are to be successful in our walk with God. Uh, This is where Paul really gets down to the spiritual nitty-gritty, covering some absolute essentials So um, I invite you to go in your Bibles, whether you have it on your phone, uh, using the one in the pew in front of you, or printed, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and this morning we're going to be taking a look at verses 10 to 12 of Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm calling this suiting up for battle, all right? Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Before we get into the message, uh, uh, those of you who have heard me know I, you know, history teacher, I tell stories, that's what I used to do. So I'm going to tell you a story. And of course, since it's history, I was a history teacher, it's going to be true. Believe me. Okay? (laughs) All right. Now, this was actually an event that Paul and everyone else in his generation throughout the Roman world, they would have known about this, all right? But we didn't know, so let me share this with you. Some 50 years before Paul wrote the letter that we know to the Ephesians, in September 9 AD, 20,000 Roman soldiers were marching through what is now modern-day Germany. What they had been told was they were on their way to crush a rebellion against Roman authority. It was a lie. It was a trap. The soldiers were spread out over some 10 miles because they were not ready to fight, and they were ambushed in the middle of this forest. And it's called by history people the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. It wasn't a battle. It was a massacre. Almost to a man, all 20,000 of those soldiers died. To this day, when people visit that forest in northern Germany, they still find artifacts, broken spears, pieces of bones, you name it, they find it, from the Roman massacre. You see, the Romans, normally that didn't happen to them. After all, they were the conquerors of much of the known world at that time, but they were slaughtered because they were totally, totally unprepared to fight. Every Christian, every Christian, whether they know it or not, is engaged in an ongoing spiritual war. It's even deadlier because it has eternal consequences. It's even deadlier than what happened to those Roman soldiers some 2,000 years ago. It's a war that requires our total dependence upon Christ, his strength, his power, if we are to be successful. Years ago, an English Bible teacher named John Stott, writing about, in his book on Ephesians, writing about this passage, he wrote this. The whole period between the Lord's two comings, his first coming, and of course when he returns, is characterized by conflict. The peace which God has made through Christ's cross is to be experienced in the midst of a relentless struggle against evil. Paul, in his last letter, when he knew he was going to be executed, is written a few years after our letter to the Ephesians, His last letter he wrote to his disciple Timothy, and one of the last things he wrote was this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He finished well. 
a ministry with all the challenges, and we don't even know all of the challenges that Paul experienced. We know some of them because we're told them in the book of Acts or in his letters, but there's a lot we don't know. But Paul says at the end, I've kept the faith. Folks, what difference does it make how well we do in our walk with God right now? I mean, that's wonderful if we're doing well now, but we want to finish well, don't we? We won't finish well unless we take very seriously what Paul is going to tell us in these 10 verses in Ephesians chapter 6. The message main point is this. We must depend upon Christ's power and strength or we will be overwhelmed. Just like what happened to those Romans. Okay, we haven't been in Ephesians for a while, so let's just do a very quick review of the letter, all right? First of all, way back when we started our study, back in the spring of last year, we went through, if you may remember, actually we started it in the fall. Okay, long time ago. (sighs) Chapters 1 to 3 of the letter, that's about our spiritual riches and identity in Christ. All right, so we explored those. And then we took a look at kind of breaking up our study from chapters four to chapter six, verse nine. That dealt with living out or walking. That was kind of like Paul's favorite term, walk. He used it a number of times in those passages, walking out our new identity in Christ. And now, as we draw the letter to a close in the next four Sundays, We're looking at verses 10 through 20 of chapter 6, and that is spiritual warfare. That is a constant reality of coming alongside our identity in Christ, all right? So what are we going to learn about specifically this morning? We're going to learn about three keys to succeed in spiritual warfare. The first one is in verse 10, that's dependence upon the Lord. We blow that. We don't have a prayer, literally. Number two, second key, preparation for battle. That's the opening statement in verse 11. And then the third key, the rest of verse 11 into verse 12, that's recognition of the enemy. And that's a lot of times where we make the mistake. All right? So now let's read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Read along with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. All right. Let's take a look then at the first key, dependence upon the Lord. Verse 10 is really the theme verse of all of these verses, okay? So the guys that are going to be following me in this pulpit, hopefully they'll all take us back to verse 10 because, again, that's the opening statement. That's the important thought we want to keep in mind. And Paul simply says there again, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, or to put that in more modern English, in his mighty strength. Or his mighty power. Paul there, he's using what the Greek scholars call a present passive imperative. What that means is that Paul is not telling us to be strong in ourselves. Because we can't be strong in ourselves. He's telling us to be strong in the Lord. This strength comes from the Lord alone. It's never ours. All right? It's like when the people of God, the returned Jewish exiles who were desperately trying to kind of get their act together in a land surrounded by enemies, and Zechariah 10, 12, it says this, and it's the Lord speaking to his people. He says, I will strengthen them in the Lord, meaning I'll give you the strength you need in myself. They will march in his name. This is the Lord's declaration. In other words, he was telling those people at that time, you're going to have to depend upon me. 
I'm your source of strength. It's the same thing for us. Now, this idea of be strong, that may sound familiar to many of us because if you think back to the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Joshua who had the task of leading the nation of Israel to conquer the land that God had promised them. But before they even went into the land, the Lord spoke to Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, 23, it says this, and the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, be what? Strong and courageous. For you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them, I will be with you. And then in the opening chapter of the book of Joshua, before they even set foot in the land that was going to be theirs, three times the Lord tells them, Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, three times at least, he says, be strong and courageous. To be strong and courageous, we cannot rely upon ourselves. You want to rely, if we rely upon ourselves, we'll end up like Peter. Remember Peter on the night that Jesus was arrested, when they were still in the upper room, Jesus told the disciples, you will all run away. You will all turn your back upon me. And Peter said, I won't. All these other guys might, I won't. And we know what the Lord told him. But Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter emphatically said, no, I won't. I won't do it. And he meant it. But he was relying upon his own strength, not upon God's. And sure enough, he did exactly what Jesus said. He betrayed the Lord. Not betrayed in the sense of Judas, but basically he said, I do not know him. And then, when he realized his mistake, we're told, Mark 14, verse 72, he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, notice in this verse 10, we're told to be strong in the Lord's might or power. Now, how much power are we talking about? How much power or strength is available to us? Well, if we back up just a few pages in our Bibles and we go back, all the way back to chapter 1, which I know it's been some time since we looked at Ephesians 1, so go with me for just a second back to chapter 1. I'm actually going to start reading at verse 16 to catch the context, but I want us to pay attention, especially when we get to verses 19 and 20. And again, we're looking at how much power is available to help us. Starting at verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know... What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Here we go. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. How much power? The same power that the Father used to raise Jesus and seat him back with him in heaven. Yeah. You better say amen. <laughs> we have an awesome God. In Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 26, the Lord asked the question there, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. 
And then Isaiah speaks, lift up your eyes and look at to the heavens. Who created all these? Now remember, when that was written, all they had in terms of what they could see was with their eyes. Which admittedly, you know, you see a lot of stars when you look up at the sky and you get away from the smog and all that and you don't have clouds like what we have. But now we have these fancy telescopes like the Hubble and the Webb and it just keeps going and going and going. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each by their name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So we have a great God, and we have literally the limitless power of God himself, which he exerted when he raised up Christ, available to us. Sometimes, guys, what we really need is a change of perspective. You know, there's a wonderful story. It's kind of buried in the Old Testament, but it's in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6. And what's going on back in 2 Kings chapter 6 is there was a prophet by the name of Elisha that was being a real thorn in the side of the king of Syria. Because every time the king of Syria wanted to do something bad to the king of Israel, Elisha would forewarn the king of Israel and mess up the Syrian king's plans. And finally, the Syrian king said, okay, we got a spy in our midst. Who is betraying us to the king of Israel? And the Syrian military said, none of us, Lord. But Elisha says the very words that you speak within your very own bedroom. So the king of Syria says, okay, we're going to fix this. I'm sending out the army. We're going to kidnap this prophet. We're going to grab him. So in the middle of the night, the Syrians charge down, and they arrive at the city where Elisha, the prophet, and his assistant are there. And then in, oh, I'm in 1 Kings. That's not going to work. Get so wrapped up in the story, I forget the scripture. Okay, here we go. 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm going to start reading at verse 15. When the servant to the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The servant looks at the Elisha, one, two. (laughs) Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Sometimes we need a change of perspective. We don't see a lot of times what's going on around us. It's interesting. Some 35 years ago, there was a book called This Present Darkness, written by a guy named Frank Ferretti. That book, because I used to work at a Christian bookstore that sold it, it sold like hotcakes. I think it sold millions of copies because what Ferretti was simply doing was in this novel, he was trying to describe his idea of the spiritual warfare, and it was spooky. A lot of people got caught up into reading that. But that was just a made-up story. But literally, we are not aware so often of the spiritual battle around us because all we can see is what we can see physically. But guys, when it comes to walking with the Lord, we have to walk by faith, not by sight, right? Okay. So an important question. Are you focused upon Jesus' strength and power or your own troubles? That'll tell us right there. That'll tell all of us what we're really looking at. It's like a professor I had in seminary named Neil Anderson that 
Neil, and he's written a lot of books, excellent books on counseling and spiritual conflicts. And I remember he drew on a chalkboard, which I'm dating myself, I know. But he drew on a chalkboard a little guy about so big, okay? And he says, guys, this is us, okay? A little stick man like that. And then he, next to that, he drew this big circle. And then on the other side of the little stick man, he drew another big circle. And he says, a lot of times, this is how we think of spiritual conflict. And one big circle, he wrote in Satan. And the other big circle, he wrote in God. And he said, so often, guys, we feel when we're in the middle of spiritual conflicts and troubles that we're this little bitty guy, little kind of puny guy, stuck between these two massive sources of power, and we're just being pulled all over the place. He said, guys, that's not how it is. So he came back to the chalkboard and left the circle alone that represented Satan, which obviously was much bigger than, than the little stick guy. And he says, okay, that's Satan. And then he took the circle that represented God, and he erased the circle, but he left God in there. And he said, the truth of the matter is this. There is not a chalkboard big enough to represent the power of God. It's off the scales. That's the spiritual reality. That's what we need to focus upon. Okay, second key when it comes to spiritual warfare, is preparation for battle. Let's go back to Ephesians. Opening statement, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That's preparing for battle. Now, Paul had a ready illustration of armor. He was chained to one. Because we're told in Acts 28 that when Paul arrived in Rome for the first time, he was under house arrest in his own rented house for two years. That's where he wrote letters like Colossians and Ephesians, those letters. And under house arrest mean that Paul could live in his own rented space and he could have people come and see him, but he was always chained to a Roman soldier. So when it comes to the description that we're going to get into later on in this series about the armor of God, all Paul had to do was simply look at the end of the chain, and he had a living example. By the way, he witnessed to those soldiers, okay? Because they couldn't get away. And he tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, the whole imperial guard knows that I'm here for the cause of Christ. But you know there is a far greater example of armor than whatever that Roman soldier was wearing next to Paul. And that is God's armor. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 16 and 17, it says this. He saw, this is the Lord, he being the Lord, he saw that there was no man and wondered there was no one to intercede. In other words, the Lord was looking for somebody to pray for the spiritual condition of Israel and Judah, and nobody was doing it. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Now, I'm sure the Roman armor was very nice, but it was nothing compared to the army of, armor of Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty himself. You know, later in the New Testament, there would be another divine warrior, Jesus himself, fulfilling his father's plan, who would battle and achieve victory through his death on the cross and his resurrection, and then he purchased us with his own blood. And Paul writes to the Colossians, he says to them and to us, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's where we are now. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of God. I 
Whose armor are we putting on? Have you ever wondered about that? Put on the armor of God. Okay. Whose armor? It's not that Roman soldier chained next to Paul. It's the very armor of God himself. That's what we're told, and it's a figure of speech, guys. It's a metaphor, and it represents the idea that when it comes to spiritual protection, who's got our back? Two things that this armor of God are meant to picture for us that we need to catch. First of all, this armor represents our new spiritual identity in Christ. Because this phrase, put on, it appears in another place just a couple chapters earlier in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, where Paul there is describing the fact that we have set aside that old man that was caught up in sin, that was our old self. We've set that aside, and instead, 424, we are to put on the new self, literally the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we're walking, basically, with a new suit of clothes, a new self. That armor of God also represents something else, guys. <coughs> Excuse me. It represents the ongoing, life-transforming presence of Jesus himself within every child of God. Now, how do we know that? From Romans chapter 13. Verses 12 to 14, it says this. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. That's all the old stuff. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In other words, we have a new identity in Christ. Our call to the gospel is to live out that new identity. And to live out that new identity means we got to walk in the armor of God. Now, <clears throat> excuse me just a second. I'm going to do this. There was a TV show years ago. Um, called Greatest American Hero. Some of us may remember this show. It was about this, uh, this guy who was just an ordinary guy, nothing special, but some aliens meet him. And the aliens decide to bless this guy with a very special costume. And they give the costume, it's kind of cute, you know, it has like a funny little symbol here, and he's got a cape, of course. And the costume will give him all kinds of superpowers, but there's a problem. And the problem is, is that when the aliens give this ordinary guy the costume, and he's very happy, and he's walking off holding this costume, wondering what he's going to do with it, he drops the book of instructions. So throughout the entire TV series, yeah, this guy can fly, but he hits walls. Yeah, he can do this, that, and the other, but he's never sure exactly what's going to happen. And the problem is, it's because he never used the costume properly. Get my drift? We have this armor, folks. The Lord Jesus provided it for us. He's given us everything we need. The question is, are you prepared for the crises and the troubles that are coming. Because they're coming. That's part of how God develops us as his people. It's through the trials and tribulations that we go through. There's no other way. 
And we have to put on the armor of God or we won't make it. All right, third key. I'm going to take off my name tag. You guys know who I am anyway. Third key, recognition of the enemy. And that is the rest of verse 11 and then verse 12. So let's take a look at that. Reading again, beginning of verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, and then here we go. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Anybody who's been in the military or has friends or family that have been in the military are familiar with this phrase, friendly fire. For those of you who aren't, friendly fire is when somebody's shooting at you and they're not your enemy. They're supposed to be on your side, okay? And it's no joke because sadly there have been soldiers who have been killed by their own fellow soldiers, all right? And a lot of times that can happen, sadly, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we get focused upon the wrong enemy. We don't realize that we're not necessarily fighting against flesh and blood. Oh, yeah, there may be that one person that attacks us for our faith. Or we read about persecution that happens in some country in the world to where believers actually have to secretly sort of hide their identity. Otherwise, they could be executed for their faith, and that is a reality. But the point is, is behind what we can see physically, there is an unseen, ruthless enemies who want to destroy you because you're a child of God. Now, the Ephesians, they knew firsthand about spiritual conflicts. Sometime take a look at Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 20. That's part of the account where Paul spent two years of his life ministering and establishing and discipling people throughout that part of the Roman world, what is known as the province of Asia, what we think of as Western Turkey. Paul ministered there for two years. And during those two years, There was an exorcism that some clowns really screwed up. These seven sons of some guy named Sceva decided, oh, we're going to cast a demon out of this guy here. And they tried to use the name of Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. And the demon spoke to them and said, hey, I know Jesus. I even know Paul. Who are you characters? Beat up all seven of them, and they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. The story spread, and pretty soon the Christians realized, we better get serious about following Jesus. So they gathered up all of their occult books, their magic books, because Ephesus was a center of witchcraft, and the occult at that time made a big bonfire and burned all of these books that they considered their treasures that totaled out to 50,000 silver pieces in value. They turned their backs upon all that because now they were walking with God. That's what happens when people enter spiritual warfare and want to do things right. They recognized who the enemy was. Now, we're told here to look out for the devil. Here's some quick facts about the devil or Satan. First of all, he's a liar, a murderer, and a destroyer. The Lord himself describes him that way. He says that when Satan lies, he's speaking his own native language because he is the liar and the father of lies. Another fact, he deceives and disguises himself. He's not going to come out and say, oh, I'm the devil. No. Paul tells us he disguises himself as an angel of light. Another fact He was defeated by Christ and will be condemned. He was already defeated at the cross. We're told that in Colossians 2.15. But his ultimate defeat will be when he is sent to the lake of fire. That's where he's going. Okay? All he's doing now, guys, is fighting a holding action. 
He knows where he's going to go. Now, Paul tells us here, be wary of Satan's schemes, or some of your Bibles might say the devil's wiles. We get our English word methods from that Greek word that Paul is using that. But notice it's in plural, because Satan doesn't just have one trick. He's not a one-trick pony that he uses the same thing over and over again to trip people up. He's had a lot of practice at this. And so he uses multiple devices, all right? Some examples of the sins that Satan uses against people. First of all, how about lingering anger? Paul specifically wrote in Ephesians 4, 27, do not let the sun go down on your anger or you will give the devil a place, literally a foothold in your life. Some of us have anger issues that we have struggled with for a long time. Folks, we got to lift that up to God and we got to keep doing it. Because Satan's using that to trip us up. He also uses false teachers, false doctrines. Paul called the people that were coming and undermining the church in Corinth, he called them false, false apostles, counterfeits. He wrote to the Galatians and said, if anybody comes to you and preaches a gospel other than the one that I told you about, the real gospel, let them be accursed. Literally, let them go to hell. And then 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, Paul wrote to Timothy and warned him. He says, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says in the last days, some people will pay attention to doctrines of demons. One of the things, sadly, that will happen just before Jesus comes back is, sadly, many folks who never really knew him will be exposed because they will turn their back upon him. Then there's greed. That's what tripped Judas up. He sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver then threw the money into the temple when he, they wouldn't take it back and went out and hung himself out of remorse. Paul writes to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, the love of money, not money itself, but the love of money is the root of all evil. I did something this week that I literally have not done in years. So I'm going to confess to you guys. I bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> you know what I won? <laughs> I didn't even get one number. And the Lord... He got after me about it because he said, you know what? That's not your source. I'm your source. Yes, Lord. So greed can be a problem. Also, what can be a problem? Misplaced confidence. That's what happened to Peter and the disciples when Jesus said, hey, you guys are all going to turn your back on me. And they said, no. And then later, yes. When we're trusting in ourselves rather than God, we got problems. Okay? And the deal is, if we're honest, sometimes an idea or action seems okay at the time. And then later, just like what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden, we realize we screwed up. One writer, he expressed it this way evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflaged trap. Okay? So the third important question, all right, how can we win? How can we win? How can we overcome this adversary that we can't even see? Paul tells us two things here. Okay? The first thing he tells us, he says it in one word. 
stand. Stand. And by the way, four times in these 10 verses, he's either going to say stand or he's going to say withstand. Sounds like that's important. He's not saying advance, attack, okay? You know, like we're going to charge hell with a squirt gun. No. He's saying when the attack comes, like that old Roman soldier would do, you stand your ground. And by the way, you got to have a community to pull this off, okay? Because I'm sure in that opening story that I told you about of what happened in that German forest to those 20,000 Roman soldiers, there were some of them who did their training, who stood. But the problem was the other soldiers were running around. And one soldier by themselves standing their ground is not going to do much good because somebody's going to just come behind him and that's it. We need a community to pull this off. We need our fellow believers to be standing together with us. That's why we preach so often here, guys, about the importance of community. Especially small groups. Because that's where a lot of times we get the strength that we need to live this life for Jesus. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the truth of the gospel. So we really do need each other to stand our ground when the conflict comes. Secondly, resist. Resist. I was just thinking of the Borg in Star Trek Next Generation. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Maybe that's so in those shows. It's not in Christian walks. Where resist, as a matter of fact, you know, he's using this metaphor of the soldier and the armor of God, and you'd think he would then say, okay, we're going to, we are not, we're going to have to fight. He doesn't say that. He says we wrestle. Well, you know, a Roman soldier, chances are, they're going to have to do hand-to-hand -hand combat, and most likely those guys were trained to wrestle. And wrestling, for those of you who've done it, you know it's very much a personal sport. Okay, you can't get much closer than wrestling somebody and you're smelling their armpit in the process. Okay? So we have to resist. All right? It's interesting. James 4, 7, it says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, frankly, I've read that verse I don't know how many times, but until this week, I don't think I really caught the opening statement. Submit, therefore, yourselves, therefore, to God. What does that mean? It means that whatever we're going through, whatever trial we're experiencing, whatever trouble we're experiencing, that came to us, guys, a lot of times because that passed through God's hands first. And what we need to do is we need to turn to the Lord and submit as we go through that trial. Now, that's tough. Because a lot of times we do not want to submit, do we? But submitting means trusting the Lord in the midst of that trial. Remember when Jesus went out to the wilderness? They were caught the fact that he went out to the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan, but the Holy Spirit led him out to the wilderness. And Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. If Jesus had to submit to his Father, submit to the Spirit, and then underwent testing, that's a lesson for us. 
And then once he was out there in the wilderness and he was being tested, he resisted, didn't he? As Satan came with three different temptations, all of which one way or another basically would have forced Jesus, if he gave in, to give up his divine mission, and then we would have had no salvation. But Jesus resisted all three of those temptations, and he resisted with the same thing that we could use. He resisted using God's very word. That's one reason why we're told to hide this word in our hearts. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our soul. So, we remember Jesus' example when he was tempted by Satan. He used the same scriptures that we have. And he won. Because notice, James says, if we resist the devil, he will flee from you. Good scripture to memorize if you haven't done so on this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you such as common to man, but God, along with the temptation, will provide a way of escape that you can bear up under it. That's a good one to memorize, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Okay. Now, as we wrap this up, two final questions, okay? First question we need to answer, ask ourselves, or ask each of us, Who are you depending upon? Jesus or your own strength? Now, if we're depending upon our own strength, we already know the outcome of that. That doesn't work, does it? But if we're depending upon Jesus and trusting him, we have all the power we need in spiritual warfare. Second question. Who are you trusting in? Jesus or yourself? Now, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can tell you up front, you're trusting in yourself. Because if you know Jesus, you have a relationship with Almighty God through His Son, And he is worthy of trust. He's worthy of our love and our devotion. So as Nate leads us, we're going to spend some time, have folks come down to the front. We're going to have some leaders of our church down here to pray with anybody who wants to come down and pray, whether it's about this message or whether it's something else. But let's do business with God. Let's do some spiritual warfare. All right? You come as the Lord leads. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. Spirit, you made me see. And I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone The Spirit, you moved in me And that your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened And on my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And heaven sit us in by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. And I will run the race by grace and grace alone. And I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Cause I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. 
So that last song, I love that song. <laughs> it just hit me that that song was all about me. Because there's that line that says, a head full of rocks. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's me. Because <laughs> I'm a dummy sometimes. And I forget that that same power that conquered the grave lives in me. Vance, that, that was, thank you for that reminder. The same power that conquered the grave still lives in me and that he is my power, and it's always available to me. Sometimes I, I, I forget that his power is there. And, and I, I love the fact of that new perspective. And what I wanna ask us to do is like, let's all close our eyes real quick. Take a deep breath and know that there is an army around us ready to fight our battles with the power of Christ. Knowing that there is an army around us ready to fight our battle with the power of Christ. You can open your eyes. Doesn't that jack you up? Like, I feel like I've had a couple Mountain Dews. <laughs> like, like that power of Christ, the power that conquered the grave is inside of us. It is available to us and there is an army around us to help fight our battles. Like, mm, I feel like I can go, go charge the gates of hell, but yet we're supposed to stand firm, right? We're supposed to stand firm because God is the power, it's not us. We're not, we're not, the, we're not gonna defeat anything, but it's God in us that's gonna do that. Thank you so much, Vance, for today's message. It was very powerful. It's very moving. I, I, I appreciate that reminder. A uh, few reminders. Um, you can put your cards in the offering boxes. You can put your offering in the offering boxes. Here at Resurrection Church, there's a couple ways you can give. You can put your offering in the offering boxes or you can go to our website, uh, www.resurrect.church and you can fill out some stuff on our giving tab and you can give that way. You can set up reoccurring givings. It's all kinds of fun. That's what we do. But, um, been talking to you guys the last couple weeks about how my wife and I, we have plans for giving and we set that forward and and, and that's, that's a really good thing. But sometimes um, I need to be reminded that I'm not in control. And when I set up my givings, I just kind of, sometimes I put it on the back burner and I'm like, 
okay. And it usually happens when my wife comes to tell me about our budget and how things are changing. And, and I, I get stressed and I get worried and I'm like, oh goodness, what are we gonna do? And, uh, and, and I have to remind myself that it's not my money and I'm not in control and it, God is in control and we're gonna do what he tells us to do. And so I just encourage you guys to give God everything, all aspects of your life, including your finances. Put him in control of your finances, in control of your life, and see the pressure that gets lifted off of your life as you're doing that. I'm gonna say a prayer for us as Vance falls to the floor. Uh, I'm gonna say a prayer uh, for us before we leave. I'm gonna pray for our offering, and then you guys will be dismissed. Father God, Lord, thank you for your word today, God. Thank you for your message. Thank you for the reminder that uh, you are in control, God. Thank you for the reminder that that power that conquered the grave, God, is inside of us, God. Thank you for that. Um, today, God, before we, go, before we leave, God, I just ask you to uh, remind us all this week that you have an army around us ready to fight our battles. All we have to do is give it up to you, God. Give it over to you, Lord. Um, God, I ask you to be with our congregation, God, as we go out uh, these doors, go back out into the world, God, as we are surrounded um, by the enemy, God. We just ask you to help us stand firm, help us to be in community that will lift us up, that will encourage us, Lord. God, give us the strength to uh, finish the things that you've called us to do, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>